Hello everyone. Uh, Dr. Carper here again for uh, this will be our final video lecture. Okay. Uh, this is going to cover pages 208 to the bottom of page 214 in book 7 of Plato's Republic. So it's only seven pages. It's only seven pages. Uh, page 208 to the bottom of page 214. That's all you need to read for this. But there, there's a lot here. This is a very, very important, perhaps the most important part of the book, okay? Uh, this is a part of the book known as uh, Plato's Allegory of the Cave. And, and by the way, yes, we are skipping books five and six. We're not going to be reading those books. We're skipping to the pages in book seven I just told you. And of course, I will send this as an assignment in Canvas as well. But I just wanted to state all of this at the beginning. Again, pages 208 to the bottom of page 214 in book seven. We're skipping books five and six, okay? But this is the most important part of the book, I believe. This is the famous allegory of the cave. And why is it called that, of course? Well, uh, once you read this, you'll see that um, Socrates lays out this image of what he says. Uh, uh, he says this image is about the effects of education or the lack of education. So that's what it's about. Uh, and he's giving this cave image or allegory or analogy uh, to explain what he uh, wants to talk about regarding education. Um, in other words, another way of putting this is the allegory of the cave is about true education versus false education. Okay. Well, the first thing we need to do is simply to lay out the analogy, lay out the allegory. What are the descriptive details of it? And Socrates gives us those details in the first couple of pages. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm going to work on the board here and I'm going to draw out a cave and uh, it's going to be very crude. I'm not an artist, but you'll get the picture. Okay, so, so start thinking about what's all in this allegory that Socrates tells us tells about in the book of uh, in the beginning of book seven okay so let's make a cave okay very good um, so let's say this is our cave and notice the cave exit slash entrance rises up like this right uh, that's important. There's there's a descent as well as an ascent. Do you remember, by the way, what are the opening words of Plato's Republic back in book one? If you go back to the beginning of book one, um, Socrates says, I went down into the Piraeus. So he's descending down into the Piraeus. He's descending down into the cave there. Uh, but that means you go down if you enter the cave. It means you go up if you exit the cave. Well, what are the different parts of this allegory? Uh, start thinking about that. Try to answer this on your own. Um, the first part that is talked about is that there is a group of people on the back of the cave wall here, okay, and I'm just going to use slit marks to, uh, to represent individuals uh, who dwell on the back of this cave wall. What direction are they pointed? They're looking towards the back of the cave wall, right? They're looking this way. And why are they doing that? Because 
They are sitting, they are seated, right, in such a way that their hands, their legs, and their necks are in chains. And they're looking at the back of this cave wall. But they're in chains. Their legs, arms, hands, neck. In a sense, though, they don't need to be in chains because... What are they occupied with? What are they doing their whole lives? They're staring, entranced. They're completely captivated by these cave shadows on the back wall, these images, these shadows that are being cast on the back of the cave wall, right? Where are those shadows coming from? Did you catch this when you read the, the opening of book seven? Well, there's a fire. Again, I'm not an artist. I'm sorry. This is going to be the fire here. There's a fire that, that's right behind them, right? Um, and there's a road that travels around the fire. And there's a group of people who travel this road. And as they get in front of the fire... They hold up these man-made artifacts that they've made, right, in front of the fire, and that's what casts the shadows on the back of the cave wall. That keeps these people totally entranced, in a trance of some kind. That's the way I like to put it. They're totally captivated by this, in chains, and that's their life just sitting in their chains, captivated by these mere shadows. And while these people do nothing but project or cast these shadows their whole lives, keeping these people in chains, right? So does that all make sense at this point? So we've got group number one here. I want to make sure you can still see this. Okay, yeah. So we've got group number one here. There's group number two, and there's a third group of people as well, right? Not a very large group, but what is the third group? Yeah, there's a third group outside the cave in the sunlight, right? They have somehow made it out of, out of the cave, and they're in the sunlight. They're not a part of this picture at all. So we've got three groups of people here. The shadow believers, the shadow casters, and those outside the cave who see things as they really are. They're not looking at shadows at all, nor are they casting shadows, right? But they see things out in the real light, in the sunlight, the bright sunlight. Okay. Well... This is the analogy of the cave, the allegory of the cave. Like with any analogy, an analogy is always an analogy of something. It corresponds to something in the real world. That it's being offered as an image of that thing, right? To help clarify that thing. So what is this trying to clarify? Remember Socrates tells us he says, compare the effect of education and that of the lack of it on our nature to an experience like this. And then he lays out the cave allegory. So once again, this is an allegory of education or the absence of education. True versus false education. Okay? So, who is group number one? in the real world. Who do these people correspond to in our world, do you suppose? Socrates actually tells us, if, if you blink, you might miss it though. <laughs> Socrates says, halfway down page 208, they are like us, he says. They're like us. This is us. We're here. We're here at the back of the cave wall looking at shadows. Socrates says, right? So,
so, and I got to make sure we can see this. Um, I'm going to put, I'm going to put number uh, the list of names for number one right here. I hope that's not confusing, so you can see it better. So these are, I will put this over here. These are the shadow believers. These are the shadow casters, remember? And these are just people who are outside the cave altogether. Okay. But who are these people in real life? Socrates tells us the shadow believers are, are us. They're just like us. And so... And he describes them, right, as prisoners. Well, that makes sense, given that they're in chains, right? Given that they're in chains. They're imprisoned by chains and shadows. Do they know they are? That We're going to come back to that. That's a really important question. Um... What else, what other sort of person is also in chains that we could put here? It's a very strong word that I think really fits here. They're slaves, aren't they? They're enslaved to their chains and to the shadows. And what are those chains? What do they represent? What do the shadows represent? We're going to come back to that. But right now we're just trying to figure out what who each of these three groups are, okay? Um, well, when Socrates says these people are just like us, he's talking about the masses. He's talking about common people, ordinary people, the masses, right? That's who these people are. I know that doesn't seem very flattering, but we've we've got to uh, we've got to see where this leads and see if it fits uh, fits life as we know it, right? Well, who is group number two? That's a really important question. Who are they really? What's another term we can give them? Well, group number two, they are, they are the cave masters. If these people are slaves, then these people are the masters, right? Overpowering and enslaving these people, right? They're the shadow casters. They're the cave masters, right? And if these people are the masses, who are these people in real life? Interesting to think about. Well, let, let's come back to that because I'm going to argue, by the way, we'll come back to this in, in just a few seconds, but I, I'm going to argue that the key to understanding this entire allegory is understanding who group number two is in depth and detail, and understanding their methods of enslavement. That, to me, is the key to understanding this allegory, and in a, in a, in, to a large degree, understanding what Plato's Republic is really all about. Okay? Well, so these are the cave masters. Who are the people on the outside, do you suppose? Well, since they're free from all of this, they're not enslaved, nor are they enslaving others. Let's just call them the free, the liberated, right? Yeah. They're out in the sun. They're enlightened. They're enlightened, right? Yeah. Who do you think these people are in real life? Since they're outside of all of this, and they're out in the sun, and they can see things as they really are. It seems to me that these are the philosophers, right? 
And this all fits because if you had to give group number one here uh, a name in terms of what they know, do they know that they are enslaved? Do you think if they did, wouldn't they fight that? They don't know that they're enslaved. They're, in fact, they're not in some kind of misery. They're probably in a, in a rather pleasant state of affairs. They're comfortable. I'm sure they really like their lives. They probably think, oh, my life is great. Look at all the, these wonderful images I get to look at all, all day long. These people are the ignorant. They're ignorant because they don't even know they're ignorant. If they knew they were ignorant, they wouldn't be ignorant anymore. You get that? That's kind of an irony there. They're ignorant. Yeah. And so, if these people, if these people here in group number one against the cable are in a state of ignorance, what state are these people in? They're not in complete ignorance. I'm going to say, and this is what Plato says, these are the peddlers of opinion and belief. Mere belief and opinion. That's what they, that's what level of knowledge they're at. Well, what level of knowledge is the third group at? They have true knowledge, right? They have true wisdom. Remember, that's what philosopher means. Lover of wisdom. Philo, love, Sophia, wisdom. They are the lovers of true knowledge. They're out in the sunlight. They're not believing uh, cave shadows, nor are they casting cave shadows, right? So, we're getting a sense of who these people are. Well, who are, let's come back to that question I told you that is so important to understanding the allegory of the cave. Who really is group number two in our world today? Who are the people casting all the shadows that everyone else believes in? Well, since the, group number one is the masses, right? And these people are casting shadows. It seems to me, mass media, to a large degree, is who these people are. Mass media, mainstream media. And we can break this down in all kinds of ways, right? Think about it. The internet. This is the internet. This is our cell phones. This is social media. I know this is getting kind of messy, but you know, you can, you can write this down because I'm saying it as I'm writing it. So we're, we're describing who group number two is here. They're the masters of social media, mass media, the internet, all of the images on our cell phones, which of course are basically like little computers, right? YouTube, Facebook, Google, Amazon, social media, uh, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, Hollywood, movies, TV. How about music? Remember in book three, we talked a lot about music that was harmful to us? and making our souls disordered, right? And so we needed to supervise what kind of music we listen to. Is it good, for example, to listen to rap all day long? Is that going to enable our souls to be more ordered and more virtuous? Is rap one of the big cave shadows that keeps these people in, in, in their slavish condition, right? And sure, we can put other 
other parties here. Uh, government oftentimes does this, right? Telling people things that just keep them in slavery. Here's something really sad. How often is education itself something that enslaves us rather than something that frees us? We're dealing with that here in America right now. A lot of shadow and falseness uh, being taught to our students today. Plato, on the other hand, is interested, I think, in liberating people. Because what's the obvious question here now, folks? How do we get out of the cave? Is it even possible to get out of the cave, right? How do we get away from believing in mere shadows or being interested in casting shadows, right? How do we get out into the sunlight? It's kind of interesting. Well, I didn't assign this in the reading, but uh, I wanted to uh, tell you about another little image in book six that Socrates gives that helps us out a little bit. When talking about the sun, can you still see? Okay, I think we've got just enough room on the board here. I may erase just a little bit here. Um, I'm going to make the sun a little smaller too, so that we have a little more room. This is known as the allegory or analogy of the sun. This is found in book six of Plato's Republic. Okay? And it, it, it's a very simple image. Plato, through Socrates, argues that there are three things necessary for vision to take place. What are they? Well, you need well-functioning eyes, right? You need an object to seek to look at, obviously. I'm abbreviating here, OBJ. You need an object, but... Unless you have what, a vision is not going to take place. What is that? You need the sun to be shining. Otherwise, the eyes cannot see the object that it's looking at. Have you ever been inside of a cave? I live, I live here in the state of Missouri in the United States. Missouri has lots of caves. And a lot of these caves have... Uh, are, are uh, owned by certain people who give tours of these caves. And once you get pretty deep inside the cave, one thing they will do is they'll shut off, they'll, they'll shut off all the lights. And why do they do that? They want to show you what absolute darkness looks like. If you're deep enough into a cave and you shut off all the lights, you can put your hand right here and you can't see it. Why? Because there's no light shining at all. Without light, without a light source, there's no vision. And notice I'm talking about being inside of a cave. If you're, if you're away from the cave entrance far enough, and, you, and, the, and there's no other uh, light source, you can't see at all. Vision will not happen. So Even if it's right in front of your face. Okay? Yeah. So, do you see how that fits the allegory of the cave? Yeah. And can you see, too, how there are different levels of knowledge? Plato talks about this in Book 6 as well. At the deepest level inside the cave, where the slaves are, the slaves in the cave are, as I wrote on the board earlier, they are in a state of ignorance. They don't know their situation at all. That's the lowest level of knowledge, to lack knowledge altogether. Correct? Make sense? 
But once you get to this level where, where the cave masters are, you know a little bit at least. And what is it? What level of knowledge is this? This is the level of mere opinion or belief, as I wrote on the board. And that's all these people really do, is they push mere opinions and beliefs and feelings and things like that. So this is a pretty ignorant level still, especially considering what it's doing to these other people. But then there are two other levels. The fourth level, the highest level, as I said earlier, is the true philosophical level of knowledge, right? Knowing and having actual wisdom. Enlightenment, right? But there, the, the important level is the level in between. And this is why we show the cave exit as a rising, as an ascent, as a going up. Because we have to climb out of the cave. It takes work to get out of the cave. This is the third level of knowledge known as critical thinking. Known as hard reflection. This is where we turn away from the shadows and from the fire. And from casting uh, shadows with artifacts and objects and puppets. Right? And move away from all of that. And we turn towards the exit of the cave. We turn towards the light, right? And we try our best to, to think about the truth of things, best that we can. This is known as uh, the stage of critical thinking. And in a way, we never really leave that stage. We're always trying to think more deeply about things, right? Yeah. Trying to examine our lives more deeply so that we can come to truth and knowledge and wisdom. Right? We could put we could put truth here as well. Right? Okay. So those are the four levels of knowledge that are involved with the allegory of the cave. Ignorance, opinion, critical thinking, knowledge and wisdom. Okay? Good. Well, just going back to the cave masters for a moment. Who do you think has a bigger influence on, the, on any people in a country? Um, who do you think who do you think has bigger influence? Hollywood, I hope I think you know what I mean by that. The people who produce all of the entertainment, Movies, TV, music, videos, all that stuff. Who has a bigger influence, those people or government? And there might be a real debate here. I think in America it's obvious, though. Hollywood and the entertainment world and social media far outweigh government in terms of who is truly influencing the people and keeping them enslaved. This is why Plato talks so much about culture and stories and music and entertainment and all of that. And if you remember again, what was Adimantus most concerned about in book two when he laid out the problem of justice as he saw it? It was all of the confusing stories about justice, right? that made it so difficult to form true beliefs about justice. Right? And remember our first two virtues from book four. Wisdom, which is knowledge of the whole, knowledge of the truth, right? And courage, which is the preservation of correct beliefs about what should and should not be feared. Right? Very important. So who has, who, who's really influencing us to behave and act as we do? That's an important question. That's a very important question in terms of how do we get out of the cave, right? Well, let's go back to that question now. What do you suppose, another way of asking the question is, what are the 
tip, what are some of the big cave obstacles that are going to get in our way of getting out of the cave? What are some things that are going to need to happen in order to get us out of the cave? Well, the one that Socrates mentions right away in the first seven pages of book seven, the ones that I assigned for you, he talks about how, how hard it's going to be to get the third group to re-enter the cave so that they can teach the first group the truth about their situation. Is group number three going to want to re-enter the cave? Is that going to be their desire? The answer is no. They're outside the cave. They're happy. They're in the light of truth. Why would they want to re-enter this mess, this dark mess, right? This realm of shadowy fire and, and shadows and ignorance and mere opinion. Why would you want to go there? But unless group number three re-enters the cave, the, the whole process of getting out of the cave never begins. Does that make sense? You have to have someone start the process. These people are not going to naturally want to turn around and face the light. In fact, that's, the, that's a second cave obstacle that will immediately confront us, right? And that is, how do we get group number one to turn around? By their very nature, they're not going to want to, right? Socrates talks about this. The moment they turn and face the light, they're going to feel pain in their eyes and they're going to want to turn right back around again and just look at shadows because that's so much more comfortable, right? They're not going to want to turn around at all. They're going to cringe and wince in pain the moment they turn around. So the very nature of the first group, the slaves in the cave, is going to prevent them from getting out of the cave. Well, even if one of them does turn around and tries to get out of the cave, what could happen next? Well, is group number two going to just let that happen? No. They're going to fight it. They're going to try and stop anyone from group number one leaving, right? By tip, maybe by, by trying to coerce them back into their slave state or by trying to tempt them to, to join their group. Why don't you join our group? Join group number two. We're hip. We're cool. We're the masters. We're the strong. We have the advantage of, the str of being stronger than everyone else. Remember that definition? Right? We're the storytellers. We're the image makers. Come join us. So that's another obstacle. There's the possibility, I suppose, I don't know how likely this would be, but there's a possibility that the philosopher who's, uh, uh, that some of the philosophers re-entering the cave themselves may be tempted to become just like number two. I don't know. Do you think that's a possible obstacle? Number three might join number two. And, of course, number one, uh, the people in group number one might just naturally want to join group number two and see, ah, oh, this is the life for me uh, and give in to that temptation. Become one of the cave masters. Can you think of any other cave obstacles? Any other obstacles to getting out of the cave? Because that's what we're trying to do here. How do we get out of the cave? Well, I told you, Socrates told, tells you at the very beginning of book seven, let me show you an image about education or the lack of it. True and false education. I'm going to erase a little bit here. Okay. So I have some space. You can rewind the tape and if you need to go back and, and get that material. I hope you've gotten it all written down. But at uh, 
on page 212, from the bottom of 211 all the way through page 212, Socrates lays out true versus false education. And he says this at the top of 212. Education is not what some people boastfully profess it to be. They say that they can pretty much put knowledge into souls that lack it, like putting sight into blind eyes. That's a very common understanding of education, that the mind is a container and what does the teacher do? The teacher comes along and fills it with stuff, with information, right? With no, so-called knowledge, right? Does that sound right to you? I don't think so. Is that what Socrates thinks? Not at all, right? Socrates says that's the false view, that we can, that teachers put knowledge into the student, like someone puts stuff into a container. This, I'm going to give you a couple of Latin terms. This is very important now. The Latin term for what we're talking about is instructera. So I-N-S-T-R-U-C-T-E-R-E. -E. Instructera. This is where we get the English word instruction from. And what it means in Latin is to fill up, to fill up. Do you see how that fits? We were just saying that this false view of, of knowing, right, assumes that the mind, the human mind is a container that just needs to be filled up with stuff. That's a false view. Why is it false? Number, the mind is not like a container. And true knowledge is not just mere information. Right? That makes the mind out to be very passive. It can't do anything. Just put stuff in me. Right? It means we can't really learn on our own. And I don't think that's a true view of human nature. Do you? What Plato was, is impl implying here is that the human being, the human mind is much more like a body. And again, I'm using this as an, just an analogy. It's much more like a body rather than a container. And, the, and what that means is the mind learns how to learn. The, the mind comes to know things by exercising its body, by exercising itself. Just as you would make your body exercise. So just as the body needs to become faster and stronger and more agile and more coordinated and balanced and have more stamina and all of those kinds of features, so does the mind. Does that make sense? It's not a passive container. It's an active set of abilities to learn and to know. And that needs to be activated, needs to be actualized. That's kind of an exciting thing to think about, don't you, don't you think? And it gives us, as human beings, a lot more dignity, right? And it, it means that we, uh, that we are capable of greater independence. Learning how to think on our own. That's what critical thinking is all about, right? But we can't think critically unless there's a real goal at the end known as truth and wisdom and knowledge, right? Otherwise, if everyone has their own reality, if everyone has their own reality, this is a view known as relativism. If everyone has their own reality, do we ever get out of the cave? If everyone has their own truth, there's no absolute truth that's outside in the sunlight. Is there a point to life then? It's a good question. Do you think Plato believes in relativism? I don't think so. In fact, I think relativism is one of the primary messages that the cave masters like to cast. That's one of the that's one of the big shadows they like to give us all the time. 
Because if, if relativism is true, then you might as well just get more comfortable inside the cave. There's no sense in trying to get out of the cave. The cave ends about right here, and it's sealed off. There's no outside. There's no ultimate reality. Well, instruction is the false view of education. It, and it, it's false because it, it does not conceive of or define the human mind, the human soul, the human person in the right way. What's the true view? Here's the other Latin term. E-D-U-C-A-R-E. E-D-U-C-A-R-E. Educara. And this is, of course, where we get the word education from. And just as instructera in the Latin had a meaning, it meant to fill up, educara has a meaning as well. It means to shape and to form. To shape and to form. Write that down. Can you see how that fits much more truly? Look what Socrates says. Right after where I left off on page 212. Socrates says, But here is what our present account shows about this power to learn that is present in everyone's soul and the instrument with which each of us learns. Just as an eye cannot be turned around from darkness to light except by turning the whole body, so this instrument, this mind, must be turned around from what comes to be together with the whole soul until it is able to bear to look at what is and at the brightest thing that is, at the sun and the things that it illuminates in reality, right? The one we call the good. True goodness. That's the highest truth. And Socrates then says, of this then, of this very turning around, there would be a craft concerned with how this instrument of the mind can be most easily and effectively turned around, not of putting sight into it. On the contrary, it takes for granted that the capacity to see is already there. You, me, even though we're inside the cave, we are capable of seeing on our own. Why aren't we seeing, though? Because we're facing in the wrong direction. We're facing the cave wall and not the, the exit to the cave. We're, we're buying into shadows cast from a man-made fire. We're not out in the true sunlight. We're facing in the wrong direction. We need to redirect our lives. We need to make a 180 degree turn away from the cave wall, and proceed out of the cave. That is the first component of true education, where the student shapes him or herself, redirects him or herself, and shapes and gives shape and form, and learns how to exercise his or her own soul, and proceeds out of the cave. The first component of true education, then, and I'm going to erase here now and put education at the top. Now we're talking about true shaping and forming. True education is redirection of the soul. And the second one is proper, proper exercise of the soul, proper exercise of the soul. These are the two components, according to Plato, of true education, of educara, not instructera. Make sense? Obviously, to get out of the cave, first we have to turn around. But that's not enough. We can't just sit there. We have to proceed out of the cave. And we have to move past the cave masters and not be tempted by them. We have to try and look towards the true light outside. We have to do the lifelong hard work 
of all that critical thinking to move away from falseness and mere opinion towards truth, knowledge, and wisdom. And that's going to require that we cultivate every part of ourselves properly. Oh, what is this reminding you of now? What did we just cover in the previous video? Do you remember? Think about it. What did we just cover in the previous video? In book four. The four virtues. What are they? Wisdom, which cultivates reason, right? We're definitely going to need that to get out of the cave if we're going to acquire true knowledge. We need to cultivate our reason so we can get wisdom. We also need to cultivate our spirited part of our soul, our wills, right? So that we can have courage. Do you think we're, we're, there, we're not going to be afraid to turn around? And to proceed out of the cave, that's going to be that's going to be very fearful. It's going to be scary. Facing one's own ignorance is very scary, don't you think? Facing that blank page or that blank computer screen, trying to fill it up with true thought, that's you've done some of that already this summer in this class. That's kind of scary, isn't it? It takes courage to become wise. We need to. Cultivate ourselves so that we can preserve correct beliefs about what should and should not be feared. But if, if we're constantly satisfying our desires, and remember back in book one we called them the mad masters, the mad masters. What do the, what do the masters of the cave appeal to all the time to keep these people enslaved? They appeal to their desires. Just satisfy your desires. But Plato, through Socrates, is telling us what? No, we need to put restraints on our desires, right? We need to master them and properly order them. Remember, that was the definition of temperance. Temperance. And when we do that, we don't so much weaken our desire as we make them a truer desire. We make them stronger, but in a different way. In a way where we master them and they do not master us. Does that make sense? This is a beautiful picture, I think, about what it really means to be human. Right? And then remember that final virtue of justice, that harmony within the soul, where each part of the soul does its own work and doesn't try to do the work of another. Right? The desires don't try and run our lives but reason and spirit runs our life instead. Make sense? And when that happens, everything in our soul is lined up properly and in proper order and harmony. And our souls become like a, a beautiful musical instrument playing beautiful music. Playing beautiful music. The Buddha talks about this kind of stuff, doesn't he? If you've read some of his writings, he talks this way much of the time about the soul. That's what happens when you discipline yourself, right? You're able to create beautiful music. To become a great musician, how much practice does that require? How much discipline? A lifetime's worth, right? Well, that's what we're talking about here. If you want to play beautiful music on your own soul, through your own soul, you're going to have to acquire wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice. Okay? Well, it seems to me that finally, that finally, we are moving away from that Trasimachus-like view where everything is about power and where we're always talking about rulers and the ruled. We're moving away from that image of society towards a different image of society. What is it? Instead of, instead of a ruler-ruled relationship, where someone is the master and someone else is the slave, we're now talking about a teacher-student relationship. 
And is there is this a power relationship like Trasimachus talks about? Or is this a knowledge-based relationship like Socrates talks about? What do you think? I think it's more like Socrates, isn't it? Especially considering, and I, I really so wish I could have been with you this whole time and we could have done an actual class where we were physically together and able to talk to one another. Because uh, the final idea I want to leave you with is when students come to class and they are fully prepared and they ask really good questions, what happens to this relationship? Is the teacher completely in charge now? No, to a great degree, the student is. The student becomes the teacher, and the teacher can become a student. This is why I love my job so much. I get to keep learning. I get to learn from my colleagues, and I get to learn from my students like you. Isn't that a wonderful vision of life? Instead of all about power and ruling and a ruler versus the ruled, we're talking about a teacher-student relationship. Where teachers become students and students become teachers. Time to move away from the mad masters. Time to move away from the cave masters. Time to seek enlightenment. It's time to find the sun. Don't you think? I hope that this has been a worthwhile class for you. I know, I'm so sorry that we had such a bumpy ride in the beginning. I wish we had more time. I would love to read this whole book with you and, and talk about it with you. Uh, I've enjoyed reading your papers so far. I look forward to seeing the rest of your papers. Um, this is the final lecture video, okay? So again, your assignment, and I will put this in writing as well, your assignment is pages 208 to the end, to the bottom of page 214 in book seven in Plato's Republic. And uh, watch this video carefully. There's a lot of important material here, right? But the question you're going to be answering, actually, let me, I'm going to go ahead and read the questions I'm going to give you uh, also in writing. Uh, <clears throat> and this will be your final paper due on Sunday. And I know there's a lot of work here, and I'm sorry, but we really needed to end at this point here. But here we go. I'm going to read off what I'm going to type for you as well. Describe the allegory of the cave and all of its individual parts. What do each of these parts correspond to in the real world? How do we get out of the cave? What are some cave obstacles that are going to get in the way of that? Which is the biggest cave obstacle to getting out of the cave, in your opinion? Who are some of the worst cave masters, and what are some examples of their cave shadows? What is true education, and how does it help us to get out of the cave? How important are the virtues in getting out of the cave? I know there's a lot there, but give me a good summary and some of your thoughts. Uh, if you want to go over... Uh, a single spaced, uh, single page of writing, feel free to do so. I'm not trying to overload you with work, but I think this is a truly fun, truly interesting assignment that I think will really help uh, each of you. Uh, hopefully, uh, it will help you with the and, and stay with you the rest of your life. That's always what my hope is when I teach philosophy, right? That... Uh, that we better understand ourselves and our place in the world and that we find true meaning and purpose in our lives. I think Plato helps us out a great deal here, don't you? Thank you so much this semester. Uh, uh, I've enjoyed uh, making these videos for you and, and talking, albeit indirectly, uh, about these ideas with you. Um, uh, good luck to you in the rest of your education and the rest of your lives. I know the world's kind of a scary place. Hopefully, philosophy will help you confront the challenges that, uh, that you are facing in your life and that you will face in your future. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone. Okay? Bye.